All right, so. So we wait here. All right, so welcome to the stream today, and uh, welcome to our discussion on taxation. That is looking at principles of taxation and uh, advanced taxation. And in the next uh, few minutes, I don't know, probably uh, 45 minutes or an hour, we're going to try as much as possible to, you know, discuss a couple of few things that we need to keep in our uh, mind, know about as we go into the example tomorrow at 9 a.m. for the principal of taxation students and then at 2 p.m. for the advanced taxation students. But before I get excited, if there is any question, something specific for me, you can raise your hand or bring you up or you put it in the chat for me, those of you joining us on Zoom. If there is something specific, a question you want me to share my thought on or talk about, you can raise your hand and bring you up or you can put it in the chat for me. We also live on Facebook as well as on YouTube. And uh, the discussion, like I said, is on taxation. So we are looking at the principles of taxation and then advanced taxation and the way we're going to be going through the various principles. So any specific question for me, something you would want me to share my thought on, you put it in the comment section for me on Facebook, the chat box on YouTube. You raise your hand, I bring you up. I'll put it in the chat session for me on Zoom as we go into the discussion this evening. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to do this in the next few hours in the discussion. I don't know, some few minutes for us to really get excited into this one. Okay, let's see. If I can go. Um. Now, when it comes to the principles of taxation examination, this is what we need to understand. Uh, it's all about principles. It's about laws. And so, you know, knowing about the laws will play a key role in your ability to be able to excel, in your ability to be able to ultimately pass the examination. So these are the principles that we need to understand when it comes to dealing with taxation, that is principles of taxation and advanced taxation. So issues about allowable and non-allowable deduction, the concept of capital allowance, repairs and improvement, the tax implication of other income, bad debt, provision for bad debt, financial cost and financial gain, the concept of established um, permanent establishment, uh, acquisition of assets, whether the entity is going to lease or buy, what is the tax implication of that? Then, capital gain, I mean, from the disposal of assets, and then the concept of gift tax, purely level two issue. Then, level three, we're going to be extending the discussion a little bit and expanding it there so that you're going to look out for the various tax planning measures that are available for a company, uh, the various advantages and disadvantages that we need to know about, then the concept of double taxation or the international taxation, then the taxation of natural resources, another fundamental area that we need to understand when it comes to dealing with advanced taxation generally as well in the discussion. Then some introductory issues are going to be very important for you to know about. Just with along with the introduction, introductory issues for principles of principle of taxation students, you're going to be focusing a lot on the uh, taxation of individuals and partnerships. Okay, individuals and partnership because one of these will be in the exam hall for you for principles of taxation students that you need to know about. And then there are, you know, other issues that we could raise concern on generally, but really these are the things that we are going to be sharing our thoughts on and the principles that we need to understand when it comes to taxation generally. So like I said, oh, I'm going to be trying as much as possible and see how many of these I can share my thought on or talk about generally wanted to see if my feed is live. I don't know. I think my YouTube is misbehaving. Let's see. I think YouTube is not that up. Even though Facebook is up. 
let's see if I can get something out of this. Yeah, Facebook is up, but I think YouTube is still not misbehaving a little bit. Let's see if I can get. That way. Okay. I think it's up, but the delay is very long. But I'm gonna go anyways. Okay. So let's begin the discussion. If there are no specific for me, let me begin the discussion. And I'm gonna be, like I said, we wanna see how far we can go in these discussions and, uh, you know call it off so that you can go and then sleep and then do your revision and go away. Generally, the concept of taxation is crucial, it's fundamental, and so there are some introductory issues that you need to understand when it comes to dealing with taxation. Definitely, uh, I will come back to that later on in my final discussion if I want to. But really, the issue about corporate tax liabilities it's a, a primary issue that we need to understand. So the tax implication for businesses. Now, the way I'm going to be go going through the discussion is this. So although corporate tax liabilities, that is the broader heading, I'm going to be covering a lot of issues that are not just related to the topic corporate tax liabilities, but we can have dedicated questions on these things only that because they are primarily related to companies i'm going to be uh, using that as my umbrella topic and then i'll break it down later on in my discussion now so when it comes to dealing with companies generally the first thing we need to deal with is the concept of allowable okay and non-allowable deductions allowable and non-allowable deductions that is where we start this whole journey. Because when we have flow in that case, and that is the idea about that. Then also, it's important to understand the types of assets that are in whichever group in the question. The type of assets that are in whichever group of the question. That is also very important that we need to look out for. And the percentages. And the percentages. So we're going to be having what? Class 1, 40. Class 2, 30. Class 3, 20. Class 4, 10. Class 5. It could be th using the economic useful life of the assets because usually they are intangible assets. And that is the idea about capital allowance. The final thing there that we need to talk about when we talk about the issue in respect of capital allowance may be the fact that the entity cannot take goodwill, okay? Um, capital allowance is not granted, okay, on goodwill. Why? Because goodwill is not a disposable sorry, a, a depreciable asset. Capital allowance is not granted on goodwill because goodwill is not a depreciable asset. Goodwill is not a depreciable asset. So you cannot get capital allowance on that amount or on that one. Then the other thing is the conditions that must be met. That's a written question before capital allowance will be granted. The entity must incur a cost to acquire the assets. The entity must have put that asset into use in the generation of the income during the year under review. And certainly the asset must be a depreciable asset. So at least four or five of the conditions, you must have a solid understanding of these conditions as you go into the exam or because the examiner can just throw you uh, something that you need to understand when it comes to dealing with these issues. So for traditional companies, these are the various things that we need to understand when it comes to dealing with the pooling system for them. Yes, Daniel, your hand is up. Yeah. <coughs> Good evening. 
Yeah, good evening. Uh, please, uh, considering the class four item, example land, I think uh, uh, during the mock, there was a question on that then, how you solved it, land. I, if you could give an example on it then, just the land. I don't understand. Land is not a depreciable asset. So we don't uh, calculate capital. Yeah, but, but in the mock, you know, there was one question on the land. And I think the documents were added, something of that sort. And so you took away the, the price of the document before. I don't know if you remember. An asset was exchanged for a land. So it's a proceeds. So the fair value of the land is treated as the proceeds that come from the disposal of the asset. So the proceeds or the fair value of the land was deducted from the written down value of the asset. And then the net figure, it's a gain. So we said that will be added to the chargeable income of the company and taxed at the standard corporate tax rate of 20%. So that's the treatment of that particular transaction that you are referring to it's an exchange and that's how we do the treatment so an asset was exchanged for a land hence the fair value of the land becomes the proceeds because it's like you've sold the asset so the fair value of the land is the proceeds and so that proceeds will just be deducted and then we got a gain in the context of that question it was a gain so we said that excess amount of the land over the written down value brought forward of the asset will be treated as a gain and added to the chargeable income and tax at the corporate tax rate. Okay. So that is for traditional companies, okay? And that is purely principles of tax and then advanced taxation as well. But then when it comes to the companies operating in the petroleum sector, so petroleum or mining companies. The journey is a little bit different here and the treatment is a little bit different. Here, all cost incurred will be put into a single pool, okay? All cost incurred are put into a single pool. And capital allowance is granted capital allowance is granted on a straight line basis at twenty percent or over five years. So for the petroleum and mining, that's all we're gonna go. I'm gonna be coming back to this when we talk about natural resources, but that's all we do when it comes to dealing with capital allowance for the companies that are operating in the petroleum and mining sector. We apply, we don't use the pooling system. We're going to be applying everything in that particular case and then look at it by putting it in a single pool. Then we grant capital allowance on a straight line basis there. So that's the issue about capital allowance and what we need to understand. Now, I'm going to be coming back to this principle because it's going to be going through the discussion a lot. Second thing is the principle on repairs and improvements. Repairs and improvements. Now, when it comes to dealing with repairs and improvements, if it is just repairs, it is allowable for tax purposes. Okay? If it is just repairs, it's allowable for tax purposes. So if we see an item, repairs, it means it's allowable. Now, if something is allowable, it means since they have deducted it, we don't do anything again. But if the thing is not allowable or we have to disallow the thing, then it means since they deducted it in arriving at the net profit that we are going to be starting with, we go and add it back. Okay, so that is that is what you need to understand. If something is allowable, we don't do anything again. It means the company has done the right thing. 
Whatever they've done, they've done the right thing. But if the thing is non-allowable, then we have to come and add it back to their profit. We have to come and add it back. And that is the way we need to understand the flow when it comes to dealing with that generally at the end of the day. Okay. So if it is just repairs, it's allowable. So no problem. But if it is repairs and improvements, what happens is that repairs and improvement does either of the two things. Number one, either it's going to increase the value of the asset. That's repairs and improvement. Or it's going to increase the productivity of the asset. Or if you want the economic useful life, it's going to extend the economic useful life of the asset. So, uh, for instance, it, it was just, you know, a wooden window. Then the company uh, put a glass window there. That is an improvement because a house that is having a wooden window will sell less than a house that is having a glass window. Or it's a concrete floor. Now they have changed it to a tiled floor. The value of the property has gone up. That is going to be repairs and improvement. And so the principle under repairs and improvement is that for tax purposes, repairs and improvement allowable, okay, shall not exceed 5% of the written down value of the asset. Okay, shall not exceed 5% of the written down value brought down of the asset. You got to be careful. So for whatever asset class that the company incurred repairs on, you're going to pick that asset class and pretend to calculate the capital allowance for the year. Please stay with me. So you're going to bring up the written down value brought forward for that asset class. Bring it down. If there is any addition, work it out. If there is any uh, disposal, addition is going to be added. If there is any disposal, take it out. Get your restated balance. Calculate the capital allowance for the year. And then you get a written down value brought down. It is this written down value brought down that you take 5% of it. And compare that to the repairs and improvement that has been incurred. If the 5% of the written down value is greater than the repairs and improvement, then all the repairs and improvements will be allowable for tax purposes. But if it is less than the repairs and improvement, then the excess amount will be disallowed for tax purposes and will then be capitalized in the asset schedule. That is the idea about this. So any amount in excess of this shall be disallowed. Okay. Shall be disallowed and capitalized. That's it. So that is all about repairs and improvement. If it is just repair, it's allowable. Don't touch it. Whatever they have done, they are correct. But if it is repairs and an improvement, then whatever asset class that they did that repairs and improvement on, pick that asset class, do your workflow. So that you can get the written down value brought down at the reporting date. Then you take 5% of that and compare it with the repairs and improvement. Then you can decide... Is it more? Is it less? Should we allow or disallow some? The portion that you're going to disallow will be added back to the chargeable income of the company. And then the, it will also be capitalized. It means you now come back to your work capital allowance workflow and then add that there. And then you can grant capital allowance on it, on the total amount as well. So that is the idea about repairs and Improvement. That's the idea about repairs and improvement. Yes, Salim. So, sir, uh, please, if I got you right, do you mean that the repairs and improvement, after getting the written down value and we calculate the 5%, the excess, that's what you are going to capitalize. Just as you said, we add it to the chargeable income and we bring it to the capital allowance schedule again. Yes. So, what I'm trying to ask is, is it that we are treating it twice? You are not treating anything twice. 
When you say you're treating it twice, what do you mean? As in when you're computing your, how do you call it, your chargeable income or your tax liability, you know, when you're adding back, we we'll add back the SS, mm. uh, calculate the 25% tax payable. And we are also calculating the capital allowance. So we are done, we are going to pick it from the accessible income to get a chargeable income. So I don't know if that's what you mean. You are, I don't know what, how you are thinking about it, but I think you're overthinking about it. The issue is any excess amount is disallowed. So if you disallow it, you add it to the chargeable income. Now, because it's a capital expenditure and you are disallowing it, it has to now be capitalized and added to the asset pool so that you calculate the capital allowance for the year. So I don't get the context of you treating it twice, but that is the principle. Disallow it means add it back to the chargeable income of the company. And because it's a capital nature, you come and capitalize it in the calculation of your capital allowance. So with your statement saying that come and add it, charge pro, uh, tax of 25%, come and add it and charge a capital allowance again and come and deduct, it's like you're making the whole thing more complicated than it's supposed to be. Let me, so let me come down. You see, when you bring your net profit, then you come back to add back. You bring your depreciation. So I'm saying that as, as part of the adding back, like how we are bringing depreciation, the excess amount, repairs and improvements, are we, we'll add that one to you if that's what you are saying. Yeah, that's we'll what add that. Saying. Yes, okay. And we'll take that figure to the capital allowance shadow and compute the, the capital allowance on it. And if that's, I don't know. If, we are not computing capital allowance on that figure. You are capitalizing the amount. So you go to your working uh, capital allowance schedule, bring your written down value brought forward, add that amount that is being capitalized, get your restated balance, and then you charge the capital allowance for the pool. You are not calculating capital allowance on that figure alone because that figure okay. will be added to the written down value brought forward of the asset. Okay, sir. thank you. I get it. All right. So that is repairs and improvement and what you need to understand in that particular case. Then, just in line, still again with capital allowance issue, it's going to be this one, acquisition of assets. And this is a tax planning issue, question that the examiner could throw at you. So a company is in the market, they want to buy an asset, and they have two options. Buy it outright and pay for it. Or better still, lease the assets. What is the tax implication for that? So this is outright purchases. Okay, outright purchases or lease it. Okay, it's very simple. When you lease the assets, two things are going to happen. Number one. Every lease payment has two components, the capital element and then the interest element. Now, the entity will get the capital element as a capital allowance. So the capital ele element is granted as capital allowance. Okay. Then the interest element is also is an allowable deduction. Okay, the interest element is also an allowable deduction. It means in principle, all the amount will be allowable for tax purposes. But for the purpose of your writing, it has to be split like this. Okay, for the purpose of your writing. So when you lease an asset, the annual lease payment is allowable for tax purposes. But for writing out our answers, we will say that the capital element, we will get it as a capital allowance. Then the interest element will be treated as an allowable deduction. But like I said, in principle, it means the annual lease payment will all be allowable for tax purposes. But for the purpose of professional presentation and explaining the principles of how the tax implication of leases works, you must split it into the two components 
and mention it or discuss it the way it has been stated here. So for leases of assets, this is how we dance. For outright purchases, it's outright purchases. So if we buy any asset outright, what's going to be happening is that it's going to be added to whatever pool, okay, it belongs. Then we will get a capital allowance on it. No problem on that, okay? However, if the entity buys any, you know, non-commercial assets, then the cost will be restricted, okay? Cost will be restricted to 75,000 Ghana cities for capital allowance purposes. 75,000 Ghana cities for capital allowance purposes. So, for instance, a a, a company buys whatever, a Pajaro or maybe a Range Rover or a Bugatti or a G-Wagon, whatever the heck. So maybe they spend uh, whatever, $250,000 to buy that asset for the CEO of the company. Yeah, we got you. No P. For tax purposes, we will cap it to 75000 So although they paid 250000 for that particular asset, it's a luxury asset, so we can't give you capital allowance on all that. So we'll cap it at seventy-five thousand. So it means only seventy-five thousand will be added, and then capital allowance will be granted on that. But the sweet spot is this: if instead of buying the Range Rover or the G wagon at two hundred fifty thousand, they decide to lease it for a number of years. The all the lease payment on the car will be allowable for tax purposes. Okay? All the lease payment will be allowable for tax purposes. And so that is the issue about financing options when an entity is seeking to acquire an asset. Outright purchases, lease obligation. Outright purchases, you need the money now. If you don't have it now, you have to go borrow money and pay interest on it. But lease obligation, you just sign a contract and every year you take the money out. And it's a better source of finance to the company. But from tax perspective, if especially we are dealing with a non-commercial asset or a luxury vehicle, then it will be better for them to lease it than to outrightly purchase that particular asset. So that is the idea also about financing options available for the acquisition of assets. Yes, Victor. And sure, please. Um, I would want to know if uh, the vehicle is for both personal use of the CEO as well as um, for for official use. How much should be should be used so far as the seventy five thousand is concerned? It depends. I don't know if you bought it. If the business has bought it and it's for official use. Then it's official. If they bought it as a gift to the CEO, then it's not for business purposes. So capital allowance will not even come to the system in the first place because it doesn't belong to the company. So they can't claim any capital allowance on it. So if it is a gift that they gave to the CEO, <laughs> that will no P. But if it is something that the CEO will use or any person personnel is going to use to do their work, then that is where we are going to be doing the capping to the 75000 for capital allowance purposes. But if it is just for the CEO because he won the CEO of the year at the Ghana, whatever the heck I was, then that one, we can't claim any capital allowance on it because it's just a gift we have given to him. In that case, he's going to file for gift tax or add it to his chargeable income and pay gift tax on it as well in that case. Yes, Victor. In sure, it's not a gift. It's for official use, but you know, he also uses it um, for private use. You now he takes it to for funerals and when he, when he closes, he takes it home and all that. So uh, the private aspect and the, the official the aspect. Unless otherwise we are giving mileage for how much it was used for official purposes and private purposes, 
which in that case then whatever capital allowance we will calculate they can only get up to the portion that was used for official purposes unless we are giving that mileage that additional information it's assumed that it's for you know business purposes now say abuani hunsu eno ana ede nua no into you know if he is uh, uh, and many people drive corporate vehicles saturday sunday they don't go to work the vehicle they chill with it so you <laughs> end so unless otherwise the mileage is given then we can grant capital allowance up to just the mileage that relates to work so that the mileage that doesn't relate to work no capital allowance will be granted in the respect of those mileage because they were not used for business purposes if that information is provided then we can prorate the capital allowance we calculate if not we just assume that it's all business including funeral and wedding ceremony and other things so that's the issue about that let me know if that makes sense for you with the clarity of that yeah it's okay Insha. thank you all right so that is acquisition of the assets financing options available and the tax implication that we need to understand Insha, please assume the vehicle after restricting it to eight seventy thousand seventy five thousand for capital allowance purposes and the same asset was disposed for say one twenty thousand how will we treat the proceeds the process is one twenty thousand so we restricted a, a, and that's where it's it's not going to be fair right we restricted it to seventy five thousand for tax purposes and you sold it and got one twenty thousand so the whole one twenty thousand will be deducted from the pool of assets that the vehicle belonged to <laughs> and <laughs> that's that's gonna be the deal in that particular case so there is no exceptional uh treatment for it because we are just recognizing it as that amount so the whole amount will be treated as a proceeds from the disposal of the whole assets for tax purposes so that's the issue about that okay so that's the next issue there in that case then what else so capital allowance gone repairs and improvements gone acquisition of assets and the financing option gone all of these things are relating to capital allowance and all that then the next thing we talk about is the concept of financial cost and financial gain so financial cost and financial gain now when it comes to the treatment of financial cost and financial gain it is important we know where we are at either we are in the traditional companies this is for principles of taxation students uh, or we are dealing with petroleum and mining please principles of taxation students anything about petroleum and mining is outside your pay grade or above your pay grade so just let it flow through your let it pass through one of your ears and come out don't let it stay in your head okay because that's above your pay grade petroleum and mining so just focus on the ones that when i say traditional companies that's your level but corporate reporting students the two are a hey, advanced taxation students the two are applicable to you guys uh in that case so financial costs are simply costs that entities incurred in care on you know derivative uh instruments okay on derivative instruments generally those are going to be financial cost okay and financial gains are simply the benefits that the entity earns on those derivative instruments so for instance the entity arrange some hedging arrangement to be able to deal with the miserable Ghana city so that it doesn't fluctuate so maybe they are using a money market hedge or they are using a, a forward contract or whatever the heck the cost that they incurred on the money market edge hedge sorry or the 
forward contract arrangement is a financial cost, then any gain that they get as a result of that money market hedge or as a result of the forward contract or whatever it is that they are dealing with is the financial gain. Now, please note that the one-liner definition is something that the examiner can ask you about. So it's important you know the one-liner definition as well for these items. Now, once we know that, the question we then ask ourselves is, how do we treat financial cost and financial gain? It's important you understand that financial cost allowable for tax purposes is not on a wholesale basis. Let me take that again. Financial cost allowable for tax purposes is not on a wholesale basis. What the heck does that mean? It means for traditional companies, the financial cost allowable is any financial gain during the year, then you add 50% of adjusted chargeable income. That is the financial cost allowable. That is the financial cost allowable. What does that mean? It means you're going to pretend to calculate this adjusted chargeable income. You're going to pretend to do that. So you have to do workings for adjusted chargeable income. How do you do that? You bring your profit or loss, whatever the heck, in the question. Then if there is any depreciation and other non-allowable deduction, you bring them in. Then... The financial cost was subtracted in arriving at the net profit or loss. So what do you do? Add it back. So we add back the financial cost. Then financial gain was added in arriving at the net profit or loss. So what do we do? We less it. So we less the financial gain. This figure is the adjusted chargeable income. And it is that adjusted chargeable income that will pick 50% of that and add it to any chargeable gain the entity had, and that will be the allowable finance or financial cost. Okay? That will be allowable financial cost. That's the idea about that. Very sweet, simple, straight to the point. Now, any financial cost incurred, so any financial cost above the financial cost allowable shall be carried over for how many years? Five. So it's carried over for five years. That is why we say I said that financial cost is not allowable on a wholesale basis. That's the meaning of that. So if we do our calculation and we realize that the financial cost allowable is 10000 but we incurred a financial cost of 9000 That means all the financial cost is allowable, so no problem. But if allowable is 10000 but we incurred 15000 then the extra 5000 would have to be disallowed. And like we said, anything that is disallowed, we go and add it back to the profit of the entity, and then we work it out. So... The way, after you do this workings, the way you now come to get your chargeable income is that now you had your adjusted chargeable income here. So what you can now do is to add back the finance gain. You come and add it back in the flow. Then you less the allowable financial cost which you worked for here. All right? then that gives you your chargeable income on which you apply the tax. That's it. That's it. So that is the default method for traditional companies, the way we deal with financial cost and financial gain. Any questions, you can raise your hand. I'll bring you up or you can put it in the chat for me as well on that one. So that is financial cost and financial gain for com traditional companies. Now, this is for only advanced taxation students. For companies operating in the petroleum and the mining sector, you remember we said that we're going to be using what we call the matching principle. Okay? The matching principle. What does that mean? It means the financial cost allowable for the year must be equal to the financial gain aimed during the year. The financial cost allowable during the year must be equal to the financial gain and during the year. 
That is what we mean by the matching principle. What does that mean? It means that if the entity incurs a financial cost without any financial gain, the financial cost will be carried over for five years. But if they incur a financial gain, sorry, they end a financial gain with no financial cost, then that financial gain will be added to their chargeable income and taxed at their tax rate of 35%. Because petroleum and mining companies pay a tax at a rate of 35%. So for the petroleum and mining people, financial cost and financial gain is on the matching principle. But for the traditional companies, the financial cost allowable is the financial gain plus 50% of adjusted chargeable income. And that is the concept of financial cost and financial gain. Very sweet, simple, straight to the point. Any questions, you raise your hand, we'll bring you up or you put it in the chat for me. Now, in order not to let your brain go a little bit haywire, let's talk about interest on loan. Stay with me. If the company borrows money, what is the tax implication of that? What's the tax implication of that? Okay, pretty simple. If an entity, stay with me carefully because, I mean, this is an interesting area that the examiner could get some goosebumps on with you in the exam hall and really play with your intelligence in the exam hall. So, interest on loans. How do we deal with it? Okay. If a resident entity, okay, a resident entity, and <laughs> you know the concept of residency already, uh, so I'm not, I'm not going to talk about that, but make sure you read that briefly. So, if a resident entity borrows money, okay, from another resident entity, from another resident entity at arm's length or that they have no relationship with, at arm's length, meaning like they have no relationship with them, then the interest on loan, all of it shall be allowable for tax purposes. For tax purposes. So, for instance, let's say that insurer premium organization borrows money from Societe General. Okay, that's fine. Whatever money we borrow, all the interest we're going to be paying on that loan, it's going to be deductible for tax purposes. No P. That's the default way. But that's not where the examiner is going to get you and get some goosebumps from you. The second level is this. Stay with me. Where a resident entity borrows money from another resident entity which has about 50% or more of the entities, then here the interest allowable for tax purposes will it we apply allowable for tax purposes shall be based on. The thin capitalization principle. I'll come back to this, but stay with me carefully here. What does that mean? It means that if we have a parent and a subsidiary, and they are all in Ghana, they are all resident companies, so the parent lends money to the subsidiary, then although they are all Domestic firms, they are sorry, they are resident companies. Not all the interest will be allowable for tax purposes because we will apply the thin capitalization principle. I'll come back to that in a second. 
Then the last layer is when a resident entity borrows money from a non-resident entity. Borrows money from a non-resident entity. That's the last one. Here also we apply this rule that not the interest allowable for tax purposes shall be based on the thin capitalization principle. Just the same thing. And so the last two is where the examiner is going to be getting some goosebumps on you. That's where the examiner is going to be getting some goosebumps on you that you, mean you must understand in that particular case. Very, very important. Very, very important. So what then is a thin capitalization concept? Pretty simple. The thin capitalization concept simply states that the debt allowable for tax purposes, okay, debt allowable, okay, for tax purposes, shall not exceed the shall not exceed three times the equity of the entity. Okay? Three times the equity of the entity. That's a thin capitalization concept. Pretty simple. But be careful. Equity here is your share capital plus retained earnings or income surplus. Because another name for retained earnings is income surplus. All right? At the beginning of the year, please, all of these things, debt allowable, equity, they are all at the beginning of the year, not at the end of the year. It's very important you understand that. Very important you understand that. So NB at the beginning of the year. Because sometimes the examiner will set you a bill of trap and expect you that you should understand it. But it's always at the beginning of the year. Very important. At the beginning of the year. Very important. Very important. So that is a thin capitalization principle. If there is share premium, we don't care. There is share deal, we don't care. There is some other nonsense things with any other component of equity, we don't care. Our focus is on these two. But this is the sweet spot. The sweet spot is that where the entity has a negative equity, then they cannot borrow, then all interest expenses and any foreign exchange laws cannot be allowable for tax purposes. So that's the catch. So where the entity, okay, where the entity, I don't want to be writing a lot though, where the entity has a negative equity, negative equity, uh, no interest, or foreign exchange, loss shall be allowable for tax purposes. It means you can ask it. You can't, the fact that you can borrow money and when you borrow the money, all the money you borrowed shall be allowable for tax purposes doesn't mean come and run your company totally with debt. If not, I mean, you are putting other companies at a disadvantage. I mean, we have to all play on the fair field, on, a, on an equal ground. That is a concept about thin capitalization. So the debt allowable for tax purposes shall be equal to three times the equity of the company. Equity is share capital plus retained earnings or income surplus. Please note, all these are at the beginning of the year. But if the entity is having a negative equity, meaning that the share capital is, say, 20000 but their retained earnings is negative 40000 That means, equity-wise, they have a negative 20000 It means 
any interest expenses they have incurred, foreign exchange losses they have incurred as a result of the capital repayment of the loan that they got from the non-resident entity will all be Yamutu to be disallowed. And if we disallow it, it means you're going to be adding it back to the profit of the entity. But then, remember, the last thing then is that the entity shall, you know, withhold an 8% tax on the interest payment. So withholding tax of 8% shall be charged on the interest payable for the year. Please, not the interest allowable for tax purposes. The total interest payable for the year. Very important. And that is the concept of then capitalization. So when we say interest on loan, its implication, this is where we are coming from. Any questions you raise your hand, we'll bring you up or you put it in the chat for me. Now, you've got to be careful, and this is to the advanced taxation students, because if there is an investor, the question, the examiner can set a question for you that, oh, an investor is seeking to invest in Ghana, and they are thinking about two things, either to buy some shares or to give the money as a loan to another company. What is the tax implication of this? Make sure nothing comes into your head and go and write things you're not supposed to be writing. Because if an investor is coming to you to advise them on whether to buy shares or to give loans, then you have to write from the perspective of the investor. So if we are writing from the perspective of the investor, it means that what is going to be happening is that when the investor buys the shares, that entitles the investor to a future income in the form of dividend. And that dividend, when paid or declared for the year, will be subject to a withholding tax of 8%. The investor, you are advising the investor. So the shares they buy entitles them to future benefits in the form of dividend. And any dividend paid will be subject to a withholding tax of 8%. Now, if they decide to go buy or to give the money out as a loan, annually, any interest that they receive because they will receive a future benefit in the form of interest income. That interest income will also be subject to a withholding tax of 8%. The investor has come. What is the tax implication of the two? This is where we stand. This is where we stand. This is where we stand. But if the question is on the flip side, where an entity is looking for influx or inflow of capital, and they are contemplating, should we go issue some shares? Or should we take loans? Then your feelings can come and you can write what you think you are supposed to write. So if from the perspective of the entity who is seeking for funding, then any additional or increase in share capital means they're going to pay what? A stamp duty of 0.5%. So any increase in share capital will result... Or let me just say we'll create a payment, some duty payment of 0.05%. No, sorry, 0.5%. Okay? 0.5%. 
They want money. They want to increase their share capital. And so they issue new shares. If they issue those new shares, then what is going to be happening is that that increase in the share capital, they will have to pay a stamp duty on it. Now, if they are increasing their share capital through the issue of, you know, bonus shares, meaning bonus issues. Bonus issues is shares where shareholders don't pay anything. Now, what is the tax implication of that? Two things. The issue of bonus shares, which means we are converting the retained earnings into share capital, it means that for tax purposes, it will be deemed as dividend. Okay? Deemed as dividend. And if it is deemed as dividend, that means there will be a withholding tax of 8% applicable on the total amount they are transferring from the retained earnings or any other reserves to the share capital. Then, that same increase will be subject to stamp duty. Subject to a stamp duty of 0.5%. Now, they will withhold the 8% and give it to the GRA, but the stamp duty 0.05% on the increase, so not on the new share capital balance. On the increase, please be careful. The stamp duty is charged on the increment, okay? The additional money that is coming in on the increment. So please be mindful of that. So if the entity is seeking to increase their share capital and they want to issue shares, then stamp duty. They have to pay that. But if they want to increase share capital and there is a transfer from the retained earnings to the share capital, then for tax purposes, that transfer is deemed as dividend. And so there must be a withholding tax of 8% and a stamp duty of 0.5% on that increment. So this is what we write from the perspective of the entity. That is why I said you have to be careful. The fact that you hear about shares doesn't mean you come and start and write oh stamp duty, deem dividend. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Know the context, know the perspective that we are coming from. Now, if they decide to go for loan notes from a foreign in person, a non-resident person, then the interest on the loan notes, okay, and any foreign exchange loss may be allowable based on or subject to the thin capitalization principle. So may be allowable subject to the thin capitalization principle. So if the company doesn't have a lot of debts already, and the company has a positive equity, then it will be better for them to, you know, go for the loan if they can write off all the interest for tax purposes rather than going to the for the shares, which will result into the stamp duty. But remember, share bonus issue doesn't bring in any money. So if the company is looking for money, they won't do bonus issue. They will do either right issue or issue at full market price. They will do right issue or issue at full market price. That is the idea about that. So that question, advanced taxation student, you got to be mindful. Who, If the examiner throws it at you, whose perspective am I writing from? Is the investor seeking my advice as to which option he should go for? Or it is an entity seeking to increase their capital or have some additional funding and we have to find out which one will be better for them. So that is also another tax implication question that examiner can throw at us that we need to know about.
Yes, Salim. Yeah, so thank you. So please, uh, from the investor's perspective, you know, we are we are charging with holding tax of 8% on both sides. But I would want to know, like, if you can please go ahead to discuss certain factors that will make the, 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 the investor to choose a reasonable choice, either the shares or the loan. There are other factors. I mean, shares will give the investor probably a voting right at the end of the day. Shares will give the investor a voting right at the end of the day. But loan notes, there's no voting right that you're going to have in that regard. Number two, the dividend withholding tax, they will be subject to that only when the entity pays the dividend. Okay, so only when dividend is declared. In other words, in a year where dividend is not declared, they're not going to pay anything. Okay, they're not going to pay anything. But for the interest, every year. Because interest will be paid whether the company makes money or not. So this one, annually. It's due to be paid annually. So that's it. And normally, these questions, we don't, you know, conclude on which the investor should go for it will depend on their interest their risk level um you know if you are an ordinary shareholder the risk is high here because if the business goes down you are likely not to get anything but if you are a debt holder you are going to be prioritized over ordinary shareholders so uh the risk here it's relatively going to be low so these are some other indicators that the investor will look out for before ultimately pulling the trigger. Shares give you voting rights. Loans, you have no voting rights. You will only be subject to pay the 8% withholding tax when dividend is declared in the share options, in the share when you buy the shares. But in the loan, <laughs> whether I like it or not, they will pay you interest every year. So the 8%, it's kajiko. It's going to be there straight up. Then... Shares, the risk is very high. Loans, the risk is very low because you are relatively going to be getting your money anyways. All other things being equal if the company goes down. Yes, Salim. Yes, sir, please. Um, I want you to firm my understanding. Like when we were doing the stamp duty, something was sounding in my mind 0.05%. So please, do you have an instance where we charge a stamp duty of 0.05% or 0.5%? purpose of the exam 0.5 percent in practice the rate is 0.5 to around five percent depending on the type of the company the stage at which they are introducing the capital and some other factors but for the purpose of the exam you stay with 0.5 percent okay so any evil spirit that is sounding to my ear 0.05 i should take it out no the reason why you have the 0.05 is that it's 0.5%, okay, like this, 0.5%. But if you are changing this into decimals, how is it going to be? I think it's going to be 0 0.005. I don't know if you are changing this into decimal. Anami boy. No, 0.005, that's correct. Yes. So probably, so this is what is sounding in your ears. It doesn't mean it's wrong. For the mass, this is how it's going to look like. But for the write-up, it is 0. Five percent. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. Okay. Any other questions for me? Let's see. I think I got some questions coming in from here. Let's see if I can bring that up. Getting some questions on YouTube. I don't know. Let's see. What do I have? Prisla Asari said, thank you for the opportunity. I need a clarification for VAT rate to use. 12.5 or 15% in the exam hall. It's 15% because that became effective long time ago. So 12.5, we've stopped using that long time ago. So it's 15%. Um, Samuel, please kindly go over the conditions that asset must meet before granting capital allowance. Why the heck is someone on you? Why the heck is someone on YouTube? Why is he on YouTube and not on the Zoom call? Aqua we pa. Okay, whatever. Let's go. Oh, I think we spoke about that. I mean, 
the entity must incur a cost uh, in the acquisition of the asset. The asset must be a depreciable asset. The asset must have been put to use uh, by the entity during the year in the generation of the income against which capital allowance is being uh, granted. Then the entity must also inform the GRA about the acquisition and the subsequent usage of the asset. So these are a couple of conditions that we can talk about here. Umar Rousseau says, thank you so much from Justice. Okay. Oh. Williams, Williams said, can you go over, please? Go over what exactly? I don't know. Go over what exactly? So probably tell me what the heck I'm supposed to go over so that I can know what the heck I'm to go over. Okay. So that is the idea about investment as well what else do i have i've so i've spoken about thin capitalization um acquisition of assets um what else am i supposed to talk about um the concept of permanent establishment uh although this is in level two principles of tax it's going to be more uh, for the advanced taxation students you know the concept of permanent establishment it's in level two though, but it's more highlighted in the level three. Permanent establishment. Um, let's see, I'm getting a question coming from here. <sighs> Please ensure out what is the tax implication on the movement in revaluation reserve? I don't understand. What is a movement in revaluation reserve? Movement you've not said anything movement in revaluation reserve from the revaluation reserves to the retained earnings or from the revaluation reserves to share capital Bismarck give me some context because I mean when you say just movement in revaluation you've not said anything like that give me a sec let me plot So then, both. Movement from revaluation surplus, revaluation surplus to share capital, it's deemed as dividend. Just like what we say, because it's a bonus issue. It's a bonus issue, because bonus issue is converting reserves into stated capital. So it's going to be taken as deemed dividend, and so you charge 8% on it. And then you go away in that particular case. And then it's charged some duty of 0.5% on it as well. So movement from revaluation surplus to the share capital is going to be taken as a dividend payment, 0.5%, sorry, no, uh, 8%, and then stamp duty, 0.5%. But from revaluation surplus to retain earnings, there is technically no tax implication on this because it's an equity movement. N I mean, nobody is getting anything really because when you move money to your retained earnings, it doesn't really change anything generally in that regard. So there is no tax implication directly on it. Uh, the only thing is that, yes, it will then feed into the calculation of the way you meet the requirement for the thin capitalization calculation. But there is no direct tax benefit on that the only tax benefit is, or the only tax implication is when we are moving from revaluation surplus to share capital. From but from revaluation surplus to retain earnings, there is no direct tax benefit really on that. So that is the issue about that. Let me know if that makes sense. Now, so the concept of permanent establishment. Permanent establishment is permanent establishment, all right? It is like a, a branch uh, of a company. So there's a question that the examiner can ask you. Again, this is just for advanced taxation students. Maybe we have an investor, okay, a foreign entity, 
seeking to have a presence in Ghana. So there's a foreign entity seeking to have presence in Ghana. And they have two options. Either they should come in as a permanent establishment, okay? That means they are registering the business as a branch. Or they should establish the company as an, they should have an independent subsidiary here in Ghana. The question we ask ourselves is, how are they going to be dealing with the issue? Or what's the tax implication for this? Remember that there is what we call trading in Ghana and trading with Ghana. Trading in Ghana means a foreign entity or a non-resident entity has presence in Ghana and hence they undertake some activities in Ghana. For that reason, the income generated in Ghana will be subject to tax. That is trading in Ghana. But trading with Ghana is where, again, a foreign company is trading or selling goods to a company in Ghana, but they don't have any presence in Ghana. For that reason, any income they earn will not be subject to tax. So make sure you get that. It's a one-liner, three-marks question the examiner can ask you. The difference between trading in Ghana, trading with Ghana. The difference is that trading in Ghana, the foreign company has a presence here. So they are doing some activities here. So the income they generate will be subject to tax in Ghana. But trading with Ghana, they don't have any presence in Ghana. So we can't tax them. We can't tax them. Now, that is different from if they did work in Ghana. So if, for instance, we go buy a plant from Turkey, right? And then the company in Turkey comes to repair the machines here in Ghana. So they bring in their technicians to come and repair their machine for us here in Ghana. That one, they have undertaken the activity here in Ghana. So when we are paying them, we will charge a withholding tax on that money and give it to the GRA. But if we just go to China or go to Turkey and go and buy a machine from Turkey, you can't charge withholding tax when you are paying the supplier <laughs> because they didn't do any work in Ghana. So that is the issue about that. But when a foreign company is seeking to have presence in Ghana, two options are available, permanent establishment and also as an independent company. Now, it is important you understand the difference between the two when you are working out and giving advice in relation to what they have to understand. Now, if it is a permanent establishment, there is no stamp duty because a branch doesn't have a share capital. But if they register it as an independent company, then they will have to pay a stamp duty because the independent subsidiary will have a stated capital on which a stamp duty of 0.5 will be paid. Will be paid. In either case, the permanent establishment will be taxed as all resident companies. So taxed uh, as any other resident company. It means they will do, you know, whatever the heck, uh, P-A-Y-E, they will do VAT, they will do everything, they pay the tax that they have to pay. So they will be taxed as any other resident company. So if you do a, an independent company, also be taxed as any other company. But then what is going to be happening is that if the subsidiary pays any dividend to that foreign country, dividend payments by the subsidiary, will be subject to a withholding tax of 8%. You know that already. Okay? Withholding tax of 8%. But with a permanent establishment branch, at the end of the year, they will repatriate all their money. They will take all the money out to their headquarters because the one in Ghana here is just a branch. So the money that they are taking out will be subject to a withholding tax of 8%. So profit after tax... If you want expatriated, it's subject to a withholding tax of 8%. Please, it is the money that they took out 
only the money that they took out that's what will be subject to the withholding tax uh, of eight percent so no stamp duty is going to be paid stamp duty will be paid tax like any other com uh, company in ghana tax as any other company in ghana any profit that they take out of the country withholding tax when the subsidiary declares dividend boom it's also going to be subject to the issue in relation to how we are going to be taxing them at the rate of eight percent withholding tax in that particular case so that is the idea about that now the um subsidiary if they register as a subsidiary then what is going to be happening is that the subsidiary can enjoy uh interest deduction in accordance with the thin capitalization principle because you know they are borrowing money from their uh subs their parent entity so interest allowable for tax purposes will apply the thin capitalization but the branch will not enjoy any of the anything like that the branch will not enjoy that benefit. So if a foreign company is seeking to come into Ghana, these are the two options. And it's a question that the examiner can ask you for you to then decide. And you remember we discussed this in class and we gave uh, some other points as well in respect of the options available to a foreign entity and how they can enter the market. So on the basis of this, it's it depends, but it's more likely that they will go for uh, the independent subsidiary especially because it's likely that they're going to give them some money so that they can write all of all of that off uh, for tax purposes at the end of the day but the benefit for the independent subsidiary although there is a stamp duty there usually is going to be outweighing the permanent establishment but that's the difference between the two options available that an entity or a foreign entity can use to enter into the country on the basis of this discussion, then we have the concept of permanent establishment. And there are two types of permanent establishment. We have what we call Ghanaian permanent establishment and then foreign permanent establishment. Please don't let the name deceive you. When we say a Ghanaian permanent establishment, we mean a permanent establishment located in Ghana owned by a foreign entity owned by a foreign entity that is what we mean by Ghanaian permanent establishment that's what we mean by Ghanaian permanent establishment Ghanaian so although you are hearing the word Ghanaian because on the average when you hear Ghanaian it means a hey, yeah, yeah, it is ours it's for us but that's not what we are doing here. Ghanaian permanent establishment means a permanent establishment located in Ghana owned by a foreign entity. So when we say the foreigner can come and establish a permanent establishment as a branch, it means it is a Ghanaian permanent establishment. A foreign permanent establishment is simply a foreign, a permanent establishment located outside Ghana okay owned by a resident entity you see the funny one the funny part here owned by a resident entity that is a foreign permanent establishment that is a foreign permanent establishment and so I've told you already the Ghanaian permanent establishment they are taxed like any other company in Ghana so that's the deal about that. But when we have a foreign permanent establishment, the way it is taxed is that usually the first uh, 182 days, the first six months of the uh, inflows is what will be subject to tax. Any amount in excess, uh, any amount outside that period is going to be tax exempt. And that is how we deal with the tax implication of foreign permanent establishment a permanent establishment located outside of Ghana owned by a resident entity and that is the concept about permanent establishment any questions about this you raise your hand and bring you up or put it in the chat for me in that particular case what do I have here
said regarding temporary concession, are we required to use the one percent or the new rate of five percent? Everything is five percent now, generally, because from April to now, we have done six months. Those rates became effective in April. So April, May, June, July, August, September, October. One, two, three, four, five, six. So the rule is six months after the law becomes effective, it is applicable in the exam hall. So if you look at it, we are in the six months, just in the six months. Hence, the new rates are going to be what will be applicable in the exam hall. So the 5% is what will be applicable in the exam hall. Okay, so that's it about that. Am I done? No. Let's go to the last thing that is also important. Taxation of other income. Let's look at other income. When I say other income, I'm talking about rent income. I'm talking about interest income. Then I'm talking about what? Dividend. Okay, so let's look at it quickly. Rent income. Okay. When an entity receives a rent income, its taxation depends on whether the entity is treating that as an investment or the entity is into rental businesses. Revenue. So are they treating it as an investment income or they are into it. So if a company that we are working for or we are calculating their taxes, they have a surplus office space and then they rent it out. That means they're going to be treating it as an investment. Taxation. The examiner can present you with an opportunity that somebody is seeking to make investments, buy shares in maybe three companies. A normal company, a company operating in the petroleum sector or a free zone enterprise. What is the tax implication of the investment? This is it. This is it. So for traditional companies, it depends on percentage of ownership. Petroleum and mining, we don't care about your ownership. We're going to tax you 28%. For free zone enterprises, it's au revoir, mes oui because it is exempted from tax. And that is one of the benefits of free zone enterprises. If you remember also, free zone enterprise is an area that the examiner could get a lot of goosebumps and, you know, talk to you about free zone enterprises. And we've spoken about the various benefits about free zone enterprises. Yes, they enjoy a concessory period of 10 years. I mean, generally, in that regard, can be owned by uh, either residents Okay, 100% owned by resident or non-resident. Resident or non-resident, you know, investors. Everybody can own it 100%. No P on that. Number three, I mean, like we just said, dividend is exempted from tax. Who doesn't like that? Dividend is tax exempt. It's a benefit they get in that particular case. But... Beyond that, we need to understand a couple of other issues. Like, for instance, they are supposed to export everything, okay? But the law requires that minimum of 70% of output must be exported outside. And they can sell a maximum of 30% on the local market. Okay, on the local market, on the domestic market. That's the law. Minimum 70, boom. Maximum 30, in. Now, you got to be careful. They are not supposed to pay any import duties and all of those uh, issues. But you got to be careful because the import duties payment is just on the portion of the amounts that they have exported okay on their export what does that mean it means when they decide to sell any of their things on the domestic market any domestic sales shall be subject to the payment of the import duty 
any domestic sale shall uh, be subject to to the import duties. So you have to be careful about that expression. It means they have to pay their import duties, NHIL, VAT, COVID levy, NHIL, whatever the heck, and all of those long taxes on import duties, they will pay it. Why? Because import duty is charged on goods that are consumed in Ghana. You get a rationale? That is why when they will package it and export it, because it won't be consumed in Ghana, we won't, they won't pay any import duty. Because that's the principle of import duty. You pay import duty because the goods or the service will be enjoyed in Ghana. But if it won't be enjoyed in Ghana, you don't pay it. That is why they are export. They won't pay the import duties when they export everything. But immediately they decide to sell something here in Ghana. Okay, come back. Let's look at the import duties. So they require also minimum administration by the customs division, but they have to monitor them, like I tell you always, because, I mean, sometimes they can, you know, pack things, get to the border, allegedly, and then file papers, allegedly, and the trailer will come back, or the truck will return, and they co come and sell the thing here in Ghana. <laughs> and they will say, oh, we exported it. We exported it. So, I mean, that is the idea about that. And then after the concessory period, what is going to be happening is that what they export will be taxed at 15%, and what they sell on the domestic market will be taxed at 25%. So that's what I was telling you, that the customs division of the Ghana Revenue Authority must monitor them, because if not, they can say, oh, we exported the thing, so that they will pay a tax of 15%, when they had actually sold a thing in Ghana. And so that is the idea about, you know, free zone enterprises as well that you need to understand. Again, if you remember in class, I mean, we got a tall list for this one. Please, I mean, level two students, this is above your pay grade. So, I mean, don't, don't be taken aback. Probably you didn't, s you've not heard about it and you'll be like, oh, my teacher didn't teach me. No, it's above your pay grade, okay? This one is above your pay grade because it's for the advanced taxation students. So that is the idea about free zone enterprises. What brought me there? <laughs> Dividend. <laughs> it's good that I took it there. So that's also about free zone enterprises that we need to understand. Then if you remember, we solved this question in class where uh, we calculated a chargeable income for the free zone enterprise. And then to calculate the tax, we use the actual sales to be able to share the chargeable income between the export and the domestic sales, then we applied 15% and 25% respectively. Remember that very well. And always when the question is given, we are going to be assuming that it is after the uh, concessory period. In other words, th they have exhausted the concessory period, and so that is why we're going to be applying whatever tax they are supposed to pay and apply it on them. Now, um, this government under the IMF program they are thinking about, you know, taking away some of the privileges that these free zone enterprises and other companies are enjoying. Yeah, because, I mean, the benefits are too much. But, you know, they are creating employment. They are adding to our GDP and all that, which is helping you to borrow more money. So, what the heck. <laughs> but they are thinking about freezing some of the benefits they get. But for the purpose of our exam, we're just going to flow like this because the benefit. Now, so if a resident entity pay dividend to another resident entity, will apply. Now, usually, like I told you, this can be treated again. And then we also said that it could be treated on account as well. But you can keep it and s treat it as a final dividend in the context of this question. When a resident entity pays dividend to another resident entity, a final dividend, so that if it is going to be subject to tax and they have included it in their income, we're going to be taking it out in arriving at the achievable income for the year. That is the first thing. Dividend by resident entity to another resident entity. And it is there are three things under that. The second thing is if the entity receives dividend from a non-resident entity. 
Okay, so dividend. by a or dividend from a non-resident entity so if they receive dividend from a non-resident entity then we follow the principle we discussed here it's on account so a Ghanaian company they have an investment in Nigeria and they receive dividend from that company that they see in they have in Nigeria, it will be treated on account. So the gross amount must be added to their chargeable income with tax, uh, corporate tax. And then if Ghana has a double tax arrangement with that foreign country in which the foreign entity operates, who pays the dividend, then the tax paid in that foreign country will be given as a foreign tax credit. Okay? Will be given as a foreign tax credit. Will be given as a foreign tax credit. So dividend from a non-resident entity. That's how we deal with it. And like I told you earlier, and I showed you in the pro forma here, whatever it is that they have added in determining their profit, we will subtract it in arriving at the adjusted profit. Then the other income line we'll bring the gross dividend that we receive from the foreign country, then we'll calculate the chargeable income for the company, and then we'll calculate the tax. Then if Ghana has a double tax arrangement with the country of residence of the entity paying the dividend, then the tax paid in that foreign country will be given as what? A credit. A tax credit relief so that we can get a tax payable by the entity that is the idea also about dividend from non-resident entity and that takes me to another issue which is going to be the concept of international taxation or what we know as double taxation and there are a lot of theories there i mean benefits of the tax treaty, objectives of the tax treaty, but really, you know, which countries does Ghana have a double tax arrangement with? Like I said, and I keep on telling you, I mean, just remember that if you get your FU money, if you get your money in the world, where do you want to travel to? Chances are 99% of the countries you want to travel to to go enjoy your money, Ghana has a double tax arrangement with them. Okay, so Nigeria. Yeah, don't, re don't disrespect you. You have to travel to Nigeria and explore there. So we have a double taxation arrangement with Nigeria. We have with the UK. We have with the USA. I mean, um, there are other companies, other countries, sorry, France, you know, name them. The list is tall. So just know about five or six of them that Ghana has a double taxation arrangement with. We need to find out about how we can actually get a tax credit when we receive money from a foreign country, whether as an entity or as an individual. Certain conditions must be met. Number one, the claimant for a foreign tax credit uh, must, uh, one, the GRA must confirm that there is a double tax arrangement with the country in which the money is coming from. Okay, Bec the reason for double tax arrangement is this, that, oh, I earn money in the USA, they've taxed me. But then when I bring that money into Ghana, because residents of Ghana are taxed on their global income, it means when I'm filing my tax in Ghana, the money that I earned in the UK, which has been taxed or in the US, which have been taxed already, I have to include it in my income again. Yeah, that's the principle because residents are taxed on their global income. Now, remember the difference between resident and non-resident because you've got to be careful about that. But that's what it is. So it makes companies and individuals sometimes evade tax because if the money has been taxed in the another country, why the heck should I include it in my income here in Ghana and pay another tax again? 
So to prevent that, countries enter into a double tax arrangement with each other so that you know they can share the tax implication of that same income among themselves and to prevent international evasion of tax. You know, tax evasion is illegal, but tax avoidance is legal. It is using the tax codes or the loopholes in the tax laws to be able to then leverage in order to maximize our tax position and minimize our tax liability. So when it comes to taking the tax credit, two things are available for companies. They can use what we call the relinquish method, okay, the relinquish approach, where the company will say that, hey, listen, as per the law, since Ghana has a double tax arrangement with Nigeria, then the income that I'm, I got from Nigeria and the tax that I paid in Nigeria on that income, it will be treated as an allowable deduction. That's the relinquish method. In the context of the question, the examiner will tell you, if they apply the relinquish method, then the tax that was paid in the foreign country will be given as an allowable deduction or will be treated as an allowable deduction in arriving at the chargeable income of the company, then we calculate the tax on it. But then, for individuals, we're going to be using the double tax arrangement credit method, which simply means that you will calculate the effective rate in the foreign country, okay? Then you calculate the effective rate in Ghana. Now, the effective rate is simply the tax that you paid all right, divided by the chargeable income, or if you want the gross income, times 100. That is the effective rate. So you calculate the effective rate of the income in the foreign country. Then you calculate the effective rate in Ghana. Again, it is going to be the tax charge, that is the tax payable in Ghana, divided by chargeable income. But the deal here is that in the determination or calculation of the chargeable income, we have to include the gross foreign income. Okay? We have to add the gross foreign income. Okay? We add the gross foreign income. Then, uh, if it's an individual, we less any personal relief because it's like income tax liabilities of individual. So, if the person is married, then... The marriage or responsibility relief, 1,200 Ghana City. If the person uh, is looking, looking after an aged dependent, uh, then we look at it. If the person is old, there is a relief available. Please make sure you go through them. Uh, if the person is an employee and contributes to the social security, but you got to be careful. Once the person is in the employment of another company and the person is not above the pension year, by default, the person must contribute to Social Security. Let's take that again. Once an individual is in the employment of a company and is not above the pension age, by law, the person must contribute into pension. So although it will not be stated in the question, as part of the relief, Social Security, that is 5.5% of the basic salary of the person, will be given as a relief. But if the person is a self-employed, it's optional. So they can't make any payments unless in the question we are told that they make contribution. Then number three, if the person is above the pension age, but it is still working for a company, au revoir, mes you are above the pension age, you don't, do, you don't contribute to any social security. So that one also it wouldn't apply. But those personal relief, depending on the context of the question, will be subtracted. Then we apply the individual graduated tax rate or the tax schedule. It will be given to you in the exam hall. Then you work it out. That is how you get the tax charge in Ghana, divided by your chargeable income times 100. After that, you have to compare the two rates. If the foreign effective tax rate is greater than Ghana's effective rate. We didn't ask the foreign country to charge you high tax. So it means that the foreign credit you are going to get is going to be the gross income, okay, the gross income multiplied by the effective rate in Ghana. Does that make sense? 
So when you compare the two rates, and the foreign effective rate is greater than the rate in Ghana, we didn't ask the foreign country to charge you more. So the foreign tax credit allowable or relief that can be received will be the gross foreign income, okay, because it's on the foreign income, the gross foreign income multiplied by the effective rate in Ghana. The answer we get becomes the tax credit, which will be subtracted from the tax charge from your uh, schedule that you will do, then you will get a tax payable to the GRE. But if we do the comparison and we realize that, oh, Ghana's rate is greater than the rate in the foreign country, then, you know, it's not a good thing. So whatever tax that was paid in the foreign country will be giving us a foreign tax credit. So here, the foreign tax credit will be equal to the total tax paid in the foreign country. Does that make sense? That's the idea about double taxation. Very sweet, simple, straight to the point. That's all about that. So the theory part, like I said, which countries does Ghana have a double tax arrangement with? Uh, what are the objectives of double taxation? What are the benefits of double taxation? And there are some limitations as well of double taxation that, you know, you need to know about that the examiner can share some thoughts on in that particular case. So that's the idea about international taxation. What brought me there? It was because I was talking about dividend from non-resident and then double taxation came in so i needed to take you through that as well any questions on this i think i'm going to be trying to probably wrap up around here i don't know there's a lot to go for again but i mean i don't want to uh keep you guys here so I think I'm going to be trying to wrap up around here, possibly, so that you can go and rest and sleep and go through the rest of the materials generally. Um, what else do I have? Okay, I've spoken about share and loans already. Okay, now, bad debt. I mean, bad debt is allowable for tax purposes if the GRA is informed about the existence of the debt and also the entity has made all efforts to receive or collect the debt, but the efforts are proven unsuccessful, then the debt will be allowable for tax purposes. Provision for bad debt, provision for bad debt on general debt will not be allowable for tax purposes, but provision for bad debt on specific debt will be allowable for tax purposes. All right? So that is something that you need to understand there. But bad debt arising from embezzlement of funds by senior staff will not be allowable for tax purposes. But bad debt arising from junior staff will be allowable for tax purposes. And you know who a junior staff is, a, a senior staff is. It's not just based on their annual salary. Or sorry, it's not just based on their position. It's also based on their annual salary in that particular case that you need to understand. So that is the concept about bad debt and provision for bad debt. Then, um, finally, let's see. 18.75%, outside regional capital, 12.5%. But in addition to that, there are some other rates that we need to be mindful of. Is this the rate? Okay, th no, this is about a... Uh, yeah, this is the rate that I need here. Okay. So, those of you with my book on advanced taxation, you're going to see this rate here. So, manufacturing companies, 25% are current thema, regional capital 18.75, anywhere else, it's 12.5%. It's important you know the company in the question so you know the rate to apply. Okay? Free zone enterprises, we've said, 15, 25%, 15 on the export, 25 on the local market after their concessory uh, period. Then there are some other rates available there. Make sure you know it very well in that regard. Um, agro processing companies, first five years, 
uh, after their tax holiday, and then after that, they enjoy 25%. Then agro processing companies, agro processing. There is a difference between an agro processing company and a manufacturing company. Be careful about the context of the question. Because if you use the wrong tax rate, au revoir, you're going to get some take, 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 but your final answer, which is going to carry a significant portion of the max, is going to be bye-bye. So make sure you have these rates here. So for agro processing, a company operating in the agro processing sector, they will enjoy a five year tax holiday. After that, these are the rates applicable to them. And agro processing is different from manufacturing. So be mindful of that based on the context of the question. Manufacturing, we've said that already 18.75, 12.5% in that regard. So that's the idea about those location incentive. So for the purpose of calculating the corporate tax and knowing the rates applicable, you must know the type of company in question, where they are located, what is their uh, operation status, and what rules are going to be applying. For advanced taxation students, if you see a free zone enterprise and you're going to just apply 25% on the chargeable income, you are in trouble because you have to split that into the domestic sales and the export uh, sales, then you can apply the respective tax rates on these figures. So that's also the final issue that you need to understand. Then some general issues, tax administration, you know, you must understand those things. The very beginning of uh, the book, we discuss those things. I mean, uh, the structure of the Ghana Revenue Authority, dealing with types of taxes, I mean, tax assessment, provisional tax assessment and self-assessment. You must know the difference between the two, the tax implications or penalties that relates to each of these in that regard. So these are also a couple of introductory issues that you need to really understand when it comes to advanced taxation. So that's it about that. My recommendation will be just keep the principles. That's all. Whatever we've discussed tonight, it's going to be playing out in the exam hall. Make sure you understand the principles. When it comes to capital allowance, get everything right. Understand the principles. When it comes to repairs and improvements, get the principle. Financial cost, financial gain, get the principles. In the exam hall, all you are doing is to apply principles. So get the principles, understand them. You cannot chew Baba, you must understand the principles and it must flow naturally, just like how it's flowing naturally here as in my discussion. Let it flow naturally in you, so keep the principles. Then read the questions carefully so that you don't go and digress. Like the examiner asks you, what is the tax implication of something? Then you are defining the thing. Or the examiner asks you to write it from the perspective of A, then you are writing it by default from the perspective of B. Where Diego? Got to be careful. Read a question carefully and make sure you understand the question. For advanced taxation students, format is very important. There is a question waiting for you in the exam hall where the examiner will ask you to write the tax implication about some things. There is a question like that waiting for you in the exam hall. There is about 25 to 30 percent of the question that you're going to have, minimum of 20, that will relate to tax implication of something. And that may call for writing a memo or writing a report. Please, that is communication. So you must know the pro forma of a memo pro forma of a report. If you remember, I explained to you the way you write these things out when the examiner asks you about the tax implication. If it is a report, your to, your from, your, uh, your subject matter, your date will come, then your intro. Your introduction is going to be sweet, simple, to the point. What the heck is it about? Then you talk about a tax issue. This is where you speak the English in accordance with Income Tax Act 2015, Act 896, as amended, da 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 is supposed to be treated this way. So you talk about the tax principle of the subject matter. 
then you contextualize to the scenario given to you tax implications. So for instance, an investor is seeking to invest in Ghana and they are seeking to buy shares. What is the tax implication of that? What is the tax implication of that? So if you are answering that, the tax issue is in accordance with Income Tax Act 2015 at 896, investment in shares is going to be creating future income in the form of dividend payment. And this dividend payment may be subject to withholding tax depending on the percentage of ownership in the entity paying the dividend. Where the ownership is above 25%, the dividend is exempted from tax. Where the ownership is below 20%, then the dividend is going to be taxed at a rate of 8%. That is the tax issue. Then you come to the tax implications. Maybe the entity is seeking to acquire 18%. Okay, then you contextualize. On the basis of the above, the acquisition of 18% will mean that any future dividend will be subject to a withholding tax of 8%. Then you come to conclusion. I hope that this analysis helps you in making your investment decision. Then you close. Sincerely yours or yours faithfully. You sign, write your name. That's all. Does that make sense? So for advanced taxation students, there is something like this waiting for you in the exam hall. Either writing a memo, writing a report. So the structure is going to be very important. Your intro must be sweet, simple straight to the point, which is just going to be based on your subject matter. Talk about the tax issue. Please, don't go and do something that you don't have to do. If you don't remember the Income Tax Act 2015 at 896 as amended, if you can't say that, just say in accordance with the tax provision and go away. Because if you don't know, and you go and say Income Tax Act 2015 at something, something. Now say wrong. They are watching so, if you can remember and flex with the examiner, flex. If you see that you can't remember it, it's not by force. Just say, in accordance with the tax provisions. And no, no, no. You are okay. You are okay. But that's the idea about that. There is a tax implication question about something. And, and a lot of the things we spoke about are all about tax implication issues. And the examiner is going to be bringing you something that you have to write and you have to calculate. Sometimes you do both calculation and writing when you are looking at tax implication of something. And so your pro forma of presentation must be very important. And that's very important. So you don't just write haphazardly anyhow. Yes, Salim. Yes, sir, sir, please, um, the powers to the Commissioner General, can you please give a brief on, how do you call it, the power to compound offenses? Can you just... He said? The, the power to com compound offenses, can you please talk about, like, a brief explanation of it? You know, the Commissioner General has certain powers. Amongst them is to issue a practice note. So I want to know, uh, the power to compound offenses, what does it mean? Oh, power to compound offenses. Yes. I don't think I have that off head. Or I can say anything about it now. Unfortunately, okay. I don't think I have that off head or to, to say anything about it. You can send send it to me on WhatsApp. After that, I'll cross check and see. I don't think I have that off head to say anything about it. Mm -hmm. But like you are saying, with the power of the Commissioner General, aside issuing practicing notes, the Commissioner General also has the power to rewrite, you know, the tax effect of various transactions. So that transactions that occur between related parties, which are not at arm's length, the tax, uh, the Commissioner General can rewrite those transactions. And that is what comes in when it comes to the limitations of standard tax planning. We have the judiciary constraints, we have the um, legislative constraints and then the uncertainty. The judiciary constraints and the legislative constraints are what give the GRA the power to rewrite, I mean, some of these transactions as well in that particular case. So, I mean, to your main question, like I said, it's not something I have of head that I can share my thought on, but 
you can send it to me on WhatsApp. I can uh, look at it and if it's possible, share my thought on it for you. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Okay, so that's it about that. And uh, I'm going to be wrapping up around here. And uh, you go in there and make yourself proud. Uh, I mean, income tax liabilities of individuals. This is level two people and partnership. It's a done deal waiting for you in the exam hall. Remember to know how to calculate your basic salary calculation. Okay. Know how to deal with benefit in kind, benefit in cash. Know how to deal with the total cash emolument because the total cash emolument is going to be affecting those benefits in kind like accommodation, vehicle with driver, vehicle with fuel, and all of those things. Please make sure you go through that very well. And for even level three people, I think I've told you this over and over again, there is a level two question waiting for you in the exam hall. Minimum of fifth, uh, 10 marks, something in level two. And it could come from everywhere. It could be VAT. It could be a withholding tax. It could be income tax liabilities of individual or partnership. <laughs> that examiner will throw at you. So make sure that uh, in addition to whatever the heck you're going to be studying, those level two issues, you're expected to know about them. So you go through them. And for those of you who have my advanced taxation book, I mean, going through that topic, you can do that very easily before 2 p.m. tomorrow. On page 75, I mean, you can look at it, the principles, the shadow, and there is one, uh, there are a couple of questions. There are a lot of questions in the book, though, but there are a couple of questions there. You can look at it. Treatment of overtime, bonuses, you know. These are questions the examiner can ask across, but that he must know about, you know, loans, benefits, what's the tax implication. So, these are purely level two issues, principles of taxation. The examiner is going to hit you there. But for advanced taxation students, he may or may not. Your best bet is to know about it. So in addition to all of the issues you will carry, you have to come and carry this cross also. It's the level two cross. It's a 10 mark area the examiner will bring to you in the exam hall. And uh, if you know it, it's better for you so that you can write some answers in respect of that. So that's it about that. I think I'm going to be wrapping up here today so that I can let you go. Or oh, What do I have? Do I have any other questions here? <laughs> oh, someone. I don't know why someone... What's it's not on the coin was joining on uh Irene Facebook. Kakraba said, How can we locate your videos on double taxation computation? Uh, unless you enroll in our courses and get access to our full courses online, unfortunately. Kakraba. Because we don't have uh these videos on YouTube, we don't have double taxation video available on YouTube. So unless you enroll in our full courses to get access to that, because everything that I have spoken about, I mean, it's available on a portal that you can get access to. And please, I mean, um, my people, uh, Ishmael, Reina, Yao, Emmanuel, and co, make sure that you go through the principles videos, okay? If you have not already, make sure you go through them because just like what I did today, this evening, the principal videos will also help you. So in case you've not gone through the principal videos, you know those videos are very, very short, short videos, 10 minutes, 7 minutes, 8 minutes, and it's something specific that we are talking about. So make sure you go through those principal videos. Maybe tomorrow whilst you're on your way to the exam hall, you can just be listening to them. By the time you get to the exam hall, you might have finished listening to them so that they stay fresh in your mind and then you can go into the exam hall and uh, do well okay and then this particular lecture also after it ends it's going to be available still on youtube and so you can just put it on autoplay as well and just be listening to these principles over and over again that's all you need to be able to pass the advanced taxation or 
the principles of taxation examination. If you understand the principles, go in there. Make sure you read the questions carefully. Take your time. Hold your breath. You should be good uh, in that case. And uh, that's all about that. So we end here today. Tomorrow we we're going to be meeting for public sector students and f uh, financial management students for Thursday. Then on Thursday we will meet for strategic case study for strategic case study on Friday. So that's it about that. All the best. And I'll see level two people tomorrow for our PSA and financial management. Au revoir.